Uh, next, we'll have our final uh, panelist here, um, Jeffrey Osler. He is a professor emeritus of history at the University of Oregon, where he continues to uh, teach part-time. And he is the author of Surviving Genocide, Native Nations and the United States from the American Revolution to Bleeding Kansas. His presentation is uh, U.S. Indian Removal, Ethnic Cleansing, or Genocide. I'm very uh, grateful to be here. Uh, when I uh, wanted to come to the conference a few years ago when it was being announced, I wanted to come because I knew I would learn a lot, and it's been a very rich uh, morning. Um, there's my campus. Uh, from 1830, the year of the passage of the Indian Removal Act, through the 1840s, the United States forcibly evicted dozens of Native nations with homelands in the eastern United States to places west of the Mississippi River. Although the Cherokee Trail of Tears is well known and the removals of the other so-called civilized tribes, the Choctaws, Seminoles, Creeks, and Chickasaws from the southeast are somewhat known, the expulsions of nations with homelands north of the Ohio River, Miami, Shawnees, Wyandots, Ho-Chunks, Potawatomis, Soxamasquakis, Kickapoos, Ottawas, Ojibwes, and others are far less known. Here are a couple of maps. Uh, this is showing the removal of communities from uh, Western Ohio and Indiana into what would become Kansas and Oklahoma. Uh, this is another one showing removals uh, of Potawatomis, Ho-Chunks, uh, and Ojibwes. As well, there is almost no awareness of the impact of the U.S. removal policy on nations with homelands west of the Mississippi, Osages, Iowas, Kansas, Omahas, Quapaws, and others. To make room for the removed eastern nations, the United States dispossessed and in some cases relocated these western nations, a process that resulted in immiseration. Because our sense of the scale of removal is so impoverished, academic historians have yet to reckon with its devastating impact. U.S. history textbooks generally note that the 1838-39 Cherokee Trail of Tears resulted in substantial loss of life. An estimate would be between four and 5,000 from a population of slightly more than 20,000. But how many textbooks inform students of the eviction of the Seminoles, Choctaws, and Creeks, and that those evictions resulted in similar losses of life? As for the northern removals, it is revealing of a major blind spot among American historians that Jill Lepore, in her highly acclaimed These Truths, A History of the United States, writes that Andrew Jackson's policy of Indian removal, quote, applied only to the South, and that this was because only a very small native communities remained in the north. In fact, however, the indigenous population north of the Ohio River in 1830 was about the same as that of the indigenous population in the southeast, and the evictions of the northern nations were often as deadly, and in some cases far more deadly, uh, than the Trails of Tears uh, from the south. So an example uh, from the north would be the evictions of the Sox and Meskwakis, or here depicted as the Sox and Foxes. Uh, and they were removed multiple times. Uh, this map is rare at even showing them, uh, but it also simplifies the removals by showing one removal uh, from uh, Western Illinois directly into what will become Kansas. In fact, Sox and Meskwakis were removed right after the Black Hawk War of 1832, removed from Western Illinois, then into Western Iowa. Iowa is about to become a state. Then they were removed to Western, to, uh, I said Western Iowa, I meant first into Eastern Iowa, then into Western Iowa, and then into Kansas, uh, and ultimately during and after the Civil War uh, into Indian Territory. So this was a process of multiple removals that forced people into abject poverty, where they were subject to starvation, exposure, lack of clean water, trauma, a rise in infant mortality, 
uh, a decline in fertility, and the constant presence of multiple diseases, including smallpox, cholera, measles, dysentery, typhus, and alcoholism. As a result, the Sauk and Meskwaki population declined uh, from around 6,500 in 1830 to 1,200 in 1860 and would further decline in the 1870s. Uh, this is a largely unknown catastrophe of staggering proportions, a full 80%. Nations indigenous to the West also suffered significant population losses because of removal. The largest Western nation, the Osages, had a population of between 5,000 and 6,000 in 1842, but after they were dispossessed of much of their land and removed from northeastern Oklahoma into southern Kansas to make room for the Cherokees, uh, their numbers declined to around 3,500 in 1857, uh, in percentage terms at least uh, as severe as Cherokee losses on their trail of tears. And yet the devastating impact of removal for the Osages is known to the Osages and some others, but it's an entirely missing fact of US history. How should we characterize the policy of Indian removal, a policy with such destructive consequences? Several historians, including Michael Green and Theda Perdue, authors of The Cherokee Nation and The Trail of Tears, and Gary Anderson, uh, ethnic cleansing, and the Indian have argued that removal should be seen as ethnic cleansing. Walter Hickson's American Settler Colonialism also describes removal of, as ethnic cleansing, though he refers to, quote, genocidal removal campaigns, but without specifying which removal campaigns might have been genocidal and why. Claudio Sant's recent Unworthy Republic, published in 2020, points out that ethnic cleansing has been, quote, rightly or criticized, and, excuse me, rightly criticized for being nebulous and even for obscuring violence, correct, but other than making the useful suggestion that we replace the term removal, uh, which Sant regards, again, correctly as artfully vague, he suggests that we replace removal with terms like expulsion, eviction, and deportation, terms which are more forceful. Other than that, Sant doesn't propose an alternative to ethnic cleansing and explicitly rejects genocide on the grounds that it, quote, elevates a single question above all others. Does the event fit the definition of the crime as defined by the 1948 United Nations Convention? Uh, on genocide. I was, I was writing myself about the removals of the Eastern nations and the impact on the Western nations for my book, Surviving Genocide. I was unsure at times about whether to use the category of ethnic cleansing or genocide or something else, but I eventually concluded that the policy must be named as genocide. The first step in my reasoning was fairly easy. The policy clearly had genocidal consequences. But the second step, dealing with the issue of intent, was more challenging. Andrew Jackson and other policymakers, of course, did not say that the reason they wanted to remove Eastern Indians was to kill them. On the contrary, they claimed that removal was benevolent as a way to save Native people from what they claimed uh, to be an otherwise inevitable, dis, uh, inevitable extinction. In other words, the policy was put forward as an alternative to genocide. But it seemed to me that even if we were to give policymakers the benefit of the doubt and regard their statements as sincere, and I realize that it's very generous actually to give policymakers then or now the benefit of the doubt. Um, but the fact that they allowed the policy to continue once they knew it was having the, consequ the consequences that it was having uh, makes them culpable. The Indian Removal Act was not just a one-off event. It was a long process that went on for decades. So to put it another way, if we could go back in time 
and ask Andrew Jackson in 1835, five years after the Indian Removal Act was passed, about his intentions in saying that Native people must continue to go, Jackson and other policymakers would have had to have said, uh, we intend to continue removing Indians knowing that it is almost certain to continue to have catastrophic consequences. And in my judgment, this is sufficient to establish the policy as genocidal, not only in terms of consequence, but in terms of intent. Now, the argument I'm making uh, for the Indian removal policy, I think, has broader implications for how we name situations of massive population loss that result primarily from disease. And it's certainly the case that in the removal policy, there's a great deal of violence. Uh, and there's also certainly the threat of violence, which forces uh, compliance. Um, but uh, it's primarily because of material deprivation and starvation and uh, loss of life through disease. So how do we categorize and think about those? And I think there's many examples. They're different in certain ways, but I think they have similar elements. Uh, there, uh, some of them I can think of are the Navajo Long Walk, the exile of Dakotas after the 1862 Dakota War against US colonialism, the destruction of Karankawas in Texas, the confinement of Western Indians on reservations in the late 1800s, and of course the California gold rush, while although Professor Madley is um, highlighted particularly, although not entirely in his talk, the extreme violence in uh, California during those years, uh, that extreme violence did intersect with dispossession, resource destruction, and enslavement, and led to malnutrition, multiple diseases, and it also then prevented population recovery because of reduced fertility and high infant mortality. Now, in general, academic and public discussions, uh, I'm almost reluctant to slow, show this next slide, but I'm going to do it. Uh, over the past several decades, have been informed by Alfred Crosby's virgin soil epidemic theory proposed in 1976 uh, in William and Mary Quarterly and amplified uh, by the work of, uh, of our new friend, uh, Jared Diamond in 1998, our old friend, our ex-friend. <laughs> Now, the virgin soil epidemic theory holds that because people know this, but uh, indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere lacked immunity to crowd diseases, particularly smallpox and measles, that upon initial contact with Europeans, more or less, all communities suffered horrific population collapses on the order of 70% or more within a few years after initial contact. Uh, versions of this theory are widely circulated and provide an alibi for European colonialism, and I would argue genocide. I also kind of hesitate to show this next slide. Uh, in August 2020, for example, Ben Shapiro, uh, speaking on the right-wing website Daily Wire, rejected, quote, the notion that the United States committed genocide against Native Americans. Uh, it, he says it's a lie based on a false equivalence between disease spreading across the United States, decimating the Native American population, which is not a genocide and an actual forcible genocide. And I'm sure most of us uh, have encountered uh, this mode of denial, that indigenous population decline was one big accident. Now, in the, fa in the past few decades, and I've been influenced by uh, these scholars, uh, Scholars like uh, David uh, Jones and Paul Kelton have challenged the virgin soil epidemic theory by pointing out that not all Europeans who arrived in the Western Hemisphere were contagious with smallpox or measles. And moreover, that human uh, immune systems are more robust and flexible than had been previously assumed. Now, my view is that Jones and Kelton may go too far in saying there's, there were never any epidemics that really have this characteristic of virgin soil epidemics. Um, but that aside, it's very clear from their work that uh, virgin soil epidemics, these were not universal. And when they hit, they did not necessarily have the devastating consequences that Crosby and others thought they did so that 
you, you, might not, you might have smallpox for the first time in a given community and it might spread, but you might only have a 20% population loss. And then depending on conditions, you could have recovery. Crucially, scholars like Jones and Kelton, what their work does also is shift the emphasis away from the moment of initial contact and instead analyze the colonial context for disease as the European invasion unfolded, showing to paraphrase Patrick Wolfe that disease was not an event, but was instead structural. So with this in mind, uh, I'd like to conclude by finally raising a question uh, about, this is something I've been thinking about more lately, about how a recognition of the colonial context for cases of massive population when disease is the primary proximate cause, um, how does the recognition of those kinds of cases fit with current approaches to defining genocide? Do these current approaches allow for recognizing cases like Indian removal and the others as genocide or do we need a new approach? Now, if we look at the UN uh, Genocide Convention, it might be possible to read it as covering instances like Indian removal that, although not explicitly intended to destroy, have that effect. So under Clause B, it's clear that removal caused serious bodily and mental harm. Uh, and under Clause D, removal prevented births within the group by adversely impacting capacities for reproduction. Um, the clause closest to Indian removal probably is C, it would seem, which identifies deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. The problem though with reading any of those clauses uh, requires demonstration of an intent to destroy, uh, to qualify as genocide, and it may not be possible to provide a smoking gun or something close to it. Now, one way to get around this problem, and scholars have taken an approach like this, would be to avoid contending directly with the UN Genocide uh, Convention definition and instead adopt what genocide studies scholar A. Dirk Moses terms a structuralist paradigm, which highlights genocidal processes rather than an intentionalist paradigm. And that's fine with me. I mean, I uh, uh, said something like this many times and uh, I found Moses when I was first thinking about these issues quite instructive uh, on this. But this approach may seem evasive to skeptics. And I've had some conversations recently with people who say, I don't buy it, I want intent. Uh, and so that suggests to me then another possibility uh, which would be to amend the UN Genocide Convention definition, at least for the purposes of historical analysis, by adding uh, under E, uh, genocide also means pursuing policies and actions that threaten the existence of the group. Now, uh, finally, in, in considering this suggestion, uh, I wanna just make one final point, which is that we should keep in mind that the definition originally was developed uh, not from some abstract theorization of what genocide might be, but from consideration of actual cases. I mean, there are a number of cases that Lemkin and the others were thinking about. So with this in mind, it seems to me there are compelling reasons to think that as we learn more about the ways in which genocide has occurred, particularly under conditions of settler colonialism, uh, where genocidal process often unfolded slowly and unevenly that it's, in re that it's quite reasonable and in fact may be compelling to adjust our definitions. Thank you. Once again, we'll open it up for any questions. Raise your hand or get your microphone. Hi, thank you so much. Just quickly, if we're going to amend the definition for the purposes of historical analysis, should we add uh, political to the national, ethnical, racial, or religious group because that was left yeah. out for historical reasons? Should we add, should we get rid of intent because in any case that's not the German case, there are no Vance protocols, so you can't, it's the papers that yeah. literally prove intent. I just, 
I, I do understand the, 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 the move because it's so, the intent, we're all tripping up on intent in different cases, I think. So I wonder if we're just getting back to Claudio Sant's argument that you mentioned, right? Which is, are we, are, is, the, is this convention kind of like the black hole that is sucking all of our political attention into yeah. it? That doesn't solve the problem. So I'm, ju I'm just raising yeah. the question, not, not resolving it. Um, do we get rid of intent? Altogether, or you proposed something earlier in the proposal in your presentation that seems to resolve it, which is to say, if the process is ongoing over a long enough period of time in which those the perpetrators are getting information about the effects that the yeah. policies are having, does that does that kind of free us from this problem? Right. Well, that that's the that's the point that I came to when I was finishing my book was just to say that about the policy of Indian removal that if you continue to pursue a policy over time and it's destroying people. You don't have to say directly what you're doing. You're doing it. So action would be sufficient for conviction, as it were. Um, yeah, but, I, but I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not, I'm not myself, uh, you know, definitely proposing this. I'm putting this on the table because I've been thinking about it. And some people have, uh, you know, I've had some discussions and some people have said maybe it's worth thinking about uh, ways to uh, revise the definition, but of course, this does open up uh, enormous problems uh, because genocide studies scholars have been, you know, d debating the convention. Everybody knows this, right? Uh, and so, yes. Yeah. I mean, this, this, you know, this language was to overcome the problems of intent and think about these kinds of projects. Jeff, this is a great presentation, and I, I highly recommend this book to everyone in the room. I think it's a very important book in Native American studies and in U.S. history more broadly, uh, and I said as much in my review of it. I want to make an intervention about intent, which is to suggest that when we think about laws in the United States or laws in any country, they're originally created by legislators or they're enacted by fiat, but it is then up to courts to explain through juridical rulings what all the intricacies of that law are. And in genocide studies, we've been strangely disinterested in the ever-growing body of convictions and what the courts have said. So if we look at the very first conviction for genocide, which is the Jean-Paul Akayesu case um, in an international criminal tribunal for Rwanda in Arusha, Tanzania, that conviction in the very first conviction has a substantial ruling from the tribunal of judges, which says that Jean Paul was guilty of genocide because he knew or should have known that the acts committed would lead to genocide. So uh, it's a project that I'm working on because I think we need this in the field, but I would, I would recommend that when folks are thinking about the crimes and when you're thinking about special intent, there's a tremendous amount to be learned from those, I think, 161 convictions and what they have to say about a whole range of crimes ranging, ranging from, uh, there are four different cases that, that deal with whether or not rape is a genocidal crime and what makes sexual violence genocidal. And there's a great deal of information now about special intent. Well, I just wanted to add something general to what you are talking now. And we are, I think we are limiting our capacity as social sciences in only on the intent issue that we all discuss. And maybe you mentioned before, Ben, the, that the motive is not the problem here. But for social sciences, the motive is very important. Because if we're trying to understand what the hegemonic process meant um, for the society and the state that perpetrated the genocide, then the motive brings a lot of light into many different issues that do not, um, I mean, that exceed the Article 2 of the Convention. Yeah, just a general comment. I think uh, the should have known uh, phrase from what you just quoted, Ben, from the Rwanda case, just one small thing about Indian removal is that, you know, uh, although public officials denied that anything negative would happen, they certainly were told that it would happen, and they were told by Native people, 
uh, quite directly. So I mean, if we're to take that seriously, then they should have known based on what they were being told. So thank you very much for your uh, talk. I'm a little bit struggling why you would not insist more. I mean, first of all, I'm uh, also a little bit over the whole discussion about what is gen genocide or not because it's a legal definition. Mm -hmm. And then we think historically, uh, actually, we uh, all agree that uh, it's kind of misleading and distracting uh, and takes t actually time off our plate. But uh, since we are doing this, I'm really struggling why you not uh, 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 put more emphasis on the uh, point C because when you think about forced removal, deportation, uh, uh, you deliberately take access to resources away from these people. Access to resources means sustained life. That means uh, in this is uh, implying physical destruction. So I don't, uh, I mean, C would be totally sufficient for me. Um, yes, C seems good as long as it's not under the clause of an, of an, uh, of an intent to destroy. If you remove the people from their natural resources, yeah. there is intent. Because that's not coincidental, right? You want to have the access to the resources. And that's why you take them away. And so I think uh, in the moment you re forcibly remove a group from their, from their natural habitat, yeah. from their sustained living, then you, ha you produce physical harm. I mean, yeah, I mean, you could very well be right, and maybe I should just stop with this exercise. The reason, the reason I'm doing it is actually um, to try to overcome uh, strong skeptics on the question of intent. That, that's the reason that I'm thinking in this way. But you know, maybe, maybe you just can't convince strong skeptics at all and should just leave it alone. Uh, you know, I brought this to kind of lay it on the table and uh, I'm perfectly happy to like go away from the conference and say, uh, uh, I'll, I'll leave things where, where they are with this, so yeah. Thank you very much for your talk and, and for the work that, <laughs> that you're doing. And I appreciate it. And I think there needs to be people working in all different components on these things. But I wonder in this question, to me, I don't want to abdicate definition, especially to the UN, right? If we're tribal sovereign nations, which we are, and I think about this in terms of uh, scorch and burn policies that were enacted immediately after George Washington became president. There's a reason we call the president's town destroyers and Haudenosaunee community, right? There's intent. We knew they yeah. meant to starve yeah. us out and yeah. to disrupt power, disrupt gender relations, et cetera. So I feel like, um, I don't know. I, to me, I don't want to, that, that's not where you put your worth kind of in, in that kind of definition in those kind of UN policies, right? In, in those particular ways to define whether there's intent or not on the, genocide, to let, to let colonial powers decide genocide. And I always talk about this in relation to Descahe. When Descahe went in front of the U in the League of Nations, when he went in front, he wasn't going to appeal to the US to do what was right, or Canada to do what was right, God no. Most, that's never gonna happen in many ways. I just don't think, I don't put much stake in the settler nation. So I feel like they're, like, how does that work in this conversation? And that's what I want to kind of see. Like, what does tribal sovereignty or like our ability to decide whether something was intent or whether something is genocide or whether something hurt or harmed our communities, our people, our, you know, this can also go for the case of how many children have been removed in the, um, this is an important question right now, right? With ICWA, how many children are making it into the welfare system, right? And, and uh, with ICWA, this is a big deal coming up. And to me, that's genocide. More children are removed from their homes than have went to boarding schools and have been lost in that system than boarding schools, right? Is there intent or not? It doesn't matter to me. Those children aren't coming home. So I just so where does that come in? Where does where does tribal relations come in here? Yeah, well, thank you, Ms. Um uh, Point well taken. I mean, uh, when I first started thinking about this, the first thing I wrote on this subject was 
a piece um, that I called an Indigenous Consciousness of Genocide, where I had recovered a number of statements by Native people and leaders, really from the 17th century well into the 19th, who were basically giving an account of the history that, that they had experienced and saying, uh, you know, we believe, say, for example, of the colonists, that there is an intent to exterminate us. I mean, they, the term genocide wasn't available uh, technically, but certainly a consciousness of that is a real um, possibility uh, from historical experience, but also looking at what was happening, that threats peoples were, 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 were actually facing, uh, really did mean there might not be uh, a next generation of Shawnees or, or whoever was, was speaking. Um, so I think, you know, I think that testimony is quite crucial and suggests to me maybe uh, I should start, you know, keep emphasizing that rather than trying to fuss around with the definition. So thank you. I have a, my own comment <laughs> to yeah. make. Um, I think this is really interesting in thinking about ICWA, and I thank you for bringing that up. And also back to the point of including not only national, ethnical, racial, and religious, but also political, because, um, you know, I, I know I'm not full scholar, but in my undergrad, I'm doing a, my thesis on ICWA right now. And the detail of the law, and of course, this is in colonial terms, we have to put it into American law legal terms in order to reach success in the Supreme Court, unfortunately. Um, but the kind of loophole that we found in the law and the thing that Indians and Native Americans are actively fighting for for ICWA is that Natives are a distinct political affiliation. Being Native American is a political affiliation that was imposed on us by colonizers. And we are not actually a race because if we go into a race, then that brings up issues of the Equal Protection Act and racial discrimination. So I think that that's really important to bring up and looking at different types of political affiliations, not just what people usually think as political parties, but certain um, identities that have been put on to groups, specifically the groups that were originally on this land by colonizers and thus, you know, they should be upheld in that way for certain laws like ICWA. So yeah, I guess not so much a question, but more a comment just based on the discussion we kind of opened here. Yeah, and I, I think a very important one, and I think ties in with what Ms. Schwann was just saying about sovereignty. So yeah, thank you. Thanks. So I'm just wondering, do people like the Pope and Justin Trudeau, do they uh, finally say, okay, it was a genocide because of popular pressure, political pressure, like wanting to be, uh, you know, reelected or that kind of thing? Or do they sit down with the UN documents and court cases and like actually think about it from their perspective? How do you think people like that come to that conclusion? I feel rather far away from them. Uh, I'm <laughs> not sure how they think. They never have called me up. Um, so I honestly don't know. Uh, it just, what, me, what are it, your thoughts? It relates yeah. to something that was said earlier about apologies. And, you know, often they're hollow, but they can make a difference for the healing of people to finally be acknowledged. And I just... Um, so I, I think a lot of indigenous folks, at least in my community, having it named as such is like, whew, we, we always knew it was, and now maybe we can yeah. uh, have slightly better relations with the settler population because they've acknowledged, uh, you know, the enormity of this violence. Well, that that seems to be a lot of what I've read from people 
you know, California Native people commenting on the creation of the Truth and Healing Commission. Um, but, you know, yeah. Thanks. Good, you're good. All right, um, that concludes our first panel. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, uh, Professor Raymond Orr, Professor Walter Del Rio, Professor Pilar Perez, and Professor Jeffrey Osler. I would also like to take this as an opportunity to thank you for having me uh, be the chair of this, of this discussion. These are very important discussions to be had, and I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, I consider it a high honor. And, uh, you know, being an indigenous person at uh, USC, especially in my department in particular, POYR, it's been very challenging, you know, unique challenges, very difficult. But having opportunities like this, where I can see indigenous excellence on full display, it really fills my heart. So thank you very much, Chief McGwitch, 